So welcome everybody. Welcome to the Mastering Shiny meeting. Today we have chapter five. That is chapter five workflow and Alua Femi will be leading the discussion. So you can start whenever you want, Alua Femi. Okay, thank you very much uh, for that uh, introduction. Uh, so today, uh, this is the, we'll be looking at uh, chapter five of the book, uh, Max Trains Shining, which is about uh, workflow. Uh, first of all, in the first part of this book, uh, Hadley started uh, the chapter uh, with some kind of uh, motivating statement that, that he think that the most secret powers in which he had is about uh, is about uh, he has been accomplishing all all these uh, tasks in over the years is by devoting much of his time to what improve his workflow because he said that uh, if we really master uh, this process of improving a workflow when we are creating a uh, shiny app uh, it will make us uh, to become a more uh, better uh, shiny developer because the we are the process in which we'll follow to create our shiny app, it will be very fast. So he said that workflow makes uh, the process of writing shiny apps more enjoyable and helps uh, helps uh, your skills in, improve uh, very quickly, which I also agree with him because if we spend more time uh, in our workflow, uh, it was going to help us to improve our efficiency while we are developing our shiny app. So like for the learning objective uh, for this uh, chapter, uh, uh, we are going to learn the basic development cycle uh, for creating a shiny app, uh, making changes and quickly experimenting uh, with the results. So we are also going to learn how to debug a shiny app. We are also going to learn how to write self-contained uh, reprex. Uh, so they kind of like explain uh, with this flow chart, uh, how we are going to, uh, our workflow, uh, when we are developing Shiny App, they split it into three uh, different workflow development cycle, uh, debug, and also look for help. So for the development cycle, uh, we are going to what, see how we can create app. Uh, we make changes into those app, and quickly we experiment uh, quickly with the app. Then we go back, we stop the app, then we go back again, to, to write in our code to create that app. We make some changes. We experiment with the app to see where we are. Then they also talk about the second part of the our workflow is about debugging. So once we are debugging, we are going to look at what is going wrong in our app in which we are uh, developing. We are also going to look at how are we going to fix uh, this problem because this is uh, useful when creating Shiny app, uh, it's not always we are going to see that we are getting the uh, required output in which we are expecting. So something will go wrong. We need to know how uh, we are going to fix uh, that problem. So, but if we have tried uh, debugging our app and still we cannot, uh, we cannot see ways in which we can solve that problem, uh, they now move over to the last part, which is looking for help. So, but before we can look for help, uh, they kind of explain that we need to write a good reprex. A good reprex, uh, we need to spend a lot of time to make this reprex as simple as possible. We need to style this reprex. We need to make it in such a way that it is reproducible, that if we are sending this uh, reprex to someone else, they are going to run this reprex and they are going to get the same output in which we are getting in our own environment. So we, but we need to make it uh, as simple as possible. So that is, uh, those, this is a three workflow uh, in which we'll be looking at uh, for to, in today's uh, discussion. So uh, at the first part, they talk about uh, development workflow. This mainly refers to developing a, uh, sh uh, our Shiny app. They say, uh, why development workflow? This are because this allows us to reduce the time between making a change and seeing uh, the outcome. And the faster we can iterate, experiment faster, we'll become a better Shiny 
uh, developer. So they talk about uh, the two main workflow to optimize here. First, it's about actually creating the creating a shiny app, which we are going to see in the demonstration part. Uh, the next part, they talk about making changes and experimenting with the result faster. Uh, this is going to uh, speed up uh, our the speed of the iterative uh, cycle in which we are going to pass through uh, when actually uh, creating our shiny app. So for for every shiny app, they talk about that. Uh, for every shiny app in which we are creating, it's going to start uh, with these six lines of code. It's going to first of all, we are going to have library shiny to start the to load the shiny app. We are going to have the UI. We are going to have the server. We are going to have shiny app uh, where we pass in both the UI and server to actually start uh, the shiny app. But it's not in every uh, way time in which we are going to have the time to do go through uh, all these steps. So, but they did discuss, they did discuss that in the workflow, if we have our scripts, okay, if we have our script set up, we can just say library, we can just write library shiny. Okay, so when we start this, we can just say shiny app. Once we have shiny app, we have control shift and enter. I mean, shiny app. Once we have shiny app, it's going to show us uh, this snippet. This snippet, which is once we click on this, is going to populate. Is going to populate uh, uh, our our studio. Is going to give us a skeletal code uh, in which we are going to use to uh, to run our shiny app. So we can just run that code. We see that actually, uh, this is uh, this is a shiny app but uh, it has no inputs. This Shiny app in which we have just uh, run, it has uh, nothing, it's just a default Shiny app. Which this is library to initialize it. This is the UI. The UI is just a default flute page. We have the server function. Uh, the server for now, the server is empty. This is starting uh, the Shiny app. So another workflow in which uh, they also discuss in creating, when creating uh, the Shiny app, is for us to click here, we go to new projects. Uh, once we go to new projects, uh, once we go to new projects, it's taking some time, we just click on new directory. Uh, we, we can select a shiny web application. We just give it a name. Uh, we select a directory where we want to put this shiny application and we, we create the app. So another workflow, in which uh, they, uh, they also uh, discuss, we can come to file, new file. Then we look at uh, shiny web application. So once we click on shiny web application, we can give it the name. We can give the shiny app a, a, a name. Uh, this one uh, is single file, dot, single file for app.r, but if we, if we once the multiple file, but we have not reached this part yet, where we is, we are going to split the UI and server into a uh, separate part. I think this is not uh, the discussion we have for today. This is a more advanced uh, topic. So, but we just click on single app.r file, where we have both the UI and server in just one app.r file. Then we are going to uh, create uh, the app. So I don't know if, up to this point, there are any question? So far, clear. Okay. So uh, they also talk about okay, we have look at shift plus tab to to put in uh, the code snippets, which is what I was trying to do there. Where we can remove, I can remove the all of these. I can just say shiny, shiny up shift uh, and tab which is going to populate this, it's going to put the code uh, snippet for us, which is different, which this is this shall we can use to showcase. So it's going to say library shiny, it's going to give us some default uh, data set, which is data.frame height. So we can, uh, we can control shift enter to just start to run the app. So we can see it's just going to give up. Oops, what's, sorry. 
it's not what I expect. Yeah, shiny, control, top. It's not giving me what I want. Shiny, shiny app. Okay, you shiny app, just use shiny app, then we put the snippets there. Then if you are using our studio, you we, we can, okay, we have seen this. We can, I've also explained this new project, new directory. Then we, we are going to have uh, the application there. So I think I've explained this part. So the next part is seeing, seeing your changes faster. So the, but they did, uh, they did explain that we should always avoid clicking on the run app when we are trying to run uh, the Shiny app, but rather that the, we should use uh, the keyboard shortcuts, which is Control plus Shift plus Enter for Windows users. Then for Mac user, it will be Command plus Shift plus Enter. So we can see that, that this is a app, this is a app. Once I press Control Shift Enter, which is a Windows, so it's just, uh, it's just going to start the Shiny app for me because they do explain that it's not every time we will just come here and be clicking on the run app uh, to start uh, the shiny app because, because uh, this can uh, slow down uh, our workflow. It can slow down our workflow when we are, let's say this is the app. So we click on run app. This is going to slow down the workflow when developing a shiny app. But they rather explain that we should always try and use the keyboard shortcuts. When we have a working app, we just press Control Shift Enter. This is going to start uh, the app. This is going to start the app for us. So let's go back to the notes. So in the second part, they talk about uh, using auto reload and run the app in the background uh, job. As uh, uh, this process is very good because once we are running the app in the background job, the app is running in a separate, is running in a separate uh, process. So we can make some changes into our app. Once we save that change, which is control S, which is for window user or command S for Mac user. So once we make, we save that changes in our file, automatically, uh, the app is going to update itself. But the talk about uh, the disadvantage of this process is that uh, as the app gets bigger and bigger, it, it becomes uh, very difficult for us uh, to debug this app. So let's see, look at a working example. Let's see a working example using this application in which I have here. So this, this is just a simple application. So we have Library Shiny, we have a UI, the UI, we have a title panel, we have a sidebar layer, sidebar panel, and my for my inputs, I only have a slider input, okay? Then for my main panel, I'm going to output a plot, which is plot output, which is, the name is this plot. Then for my server, this is the server, I am just outputting uh, that plot. So we need to have a separate, we need to have a separate script, which is shinyrun.r. So when we have shinyrun.r, we need to set options. For we use shiny.autoreload, we set it to true, which will make sure that any changes we make to the app, then we now need to put shiny run app to start that app. So what I'll do here in this case, so I'll comment out the title for now and save this. Okay, come back to the shiny.auto reload. So I'll go down to the jobs, start jobs. Okay, so everything. Then within here, we, we are going to select the R script, the path, browse to the file path where we have the R script uh, for the jobs. So in this case, I've, it has already been selected. So I didn't have not selected, I will just browse. I will just browse and look for that file. Is this file? I will say open. So I'll click that. Then I will need to select the working directory uh, where I want to run these jobs. 
So this work is still this working directory. So I'll select that. Then I'm going to start the job. Okay, so when I start the job, I will just see this listening. So I will need to copy this port. I need to copy this port, copy it, come here to say our studio. Our studio API, then view, viewer. Then we pass in the URL as a string, paste the URL there. So once I do this, it's going to show uh, this app. It's going to show us this app. So let me see that this is running in my win. Okay, it's running in my Windows. Okay, so we are going to have we are going to have this app. We can run the slider. We can run the slider. But this app for now, I've removed the title. So I will now go back to the app.r. Okay, I uncomment this and I save Control S, which because I am because I am on Windows. So once I say Control S, we can see that the app automatically there is an update because I have made changes on my code. I have saved that changes and the app. The app updates in real time. We can see that we have now seen the title, so I can I can comment this again so that we see and make changes. You see that the title it disappears. So once I uncomment this again and I save this, we can see uh, these uh, changes in real time. So this is very useful for the uh, the best part of this is that we have this app running in a separate uh, uh, process different from our out studio, we can still, while the app is running a separate process, I can say one plus one, which is two, we can say two plus four, which is six. So we can we can still run our out code because this app is running in a separate process background job, which is very uh, useful, which is very useful in this case, our, our R console is not busy. We can do some other computation within our R console because this, our application is running, is not running, is running in a separate process, but they do explain that the drawback of this process is that when this app becomes bigger and bigger, it becomes uh, difficult for us uh, to debug the app because because becomes difficult for us to debug if there are any issue with the app in which they are, we are developing, it becomes difficult for us uh, to debug in that process. So that is uh, the major drawback in which uh, they explain in the book. So I think I will stop the job so that I don't know if there are any questions before I stop the job. Yeah, I mean, running these background jobs is quite new to me. And uh, yeah, if I may ask this uh, script shiny-run.r, did you create it manually like a new script and then you saved it in the working directory or it is generated when you initiate uh, background jobs? No, I, I created the script for shiny-run.r. Uh-huh, and then you saved it in the directory and yeah. Yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. Okay. Then, okay. then for the jobs, we need to specify the parts where we can get that. Maybe in case we name whatever name we use to name that file in the job, mm -hmm. we need to reference that file. We select the file, then we select the working directory uh, where let me stop this and start that process again. So yeah, we could just come back to the jobs, tabs, start a new job. So we can see this is the file part where we can get the app.r file. Yes. Okay. So we start, we get the app.r file here. Then we specify the working directory, uh, the working directory. Uh, where we want to run this job from. Okay, mm -hmm. so when we specify that working directory, the next thing for us to do is start that job. Mm -hmm. So once once I start that job, once I start that job, I think the job is running. Once I start that job, what that job is going to do that is going to pick, first of all, it's going to use option shiny.auto reloads is set to true. That means that function means that any changes we make to the initial app.r file, 
-hmm. is going to automate. Once we save that changes, this that line two is going to make sure that that changes update in real time. We are going to see that update in real time. Why line three here is starting the shiny app because it's shiny run app, which is going to start the shiny app. So we will need to now for us to see uh, that app running here. First, I'll need to copy this URL. Then I say our studio, our studio API viewer because I want to run it in my viewer pane. It's going to ask me for the URL. I pass in the URL here. So once I pass in that URL, it's supposed to shoot the app. It's like the job is not running. Succeed. Stop job. Let me stop the job. The job is not running. Yeah. Terminal console jobs. This job is not running. Mm -hmm. oh. Where is the run? Can I run it from here? Yep. We can also run it from there. OK. Yep. So this is the jobs. So let me go back to my R scripts. Let me comment this Thank out. Yep. Save this. Let's mm -hmm. see if we can see it updates. Perfect. We can't, yep. we can't see the title there. So mm -hmm. I can also shift this. I can, I can uncomment that title. Save mm -hmm. it, bring the app back. We can now see the title is there. So I found this very useful because we can also use uh, this uh, process to run uh, several uh, models, which is very useful. I think they explain that. I will just encourage us, we should look at this repo. We can clone, we can clone uh, that repo. There are several useful examples that is in that repo. There are several useful examples, not only specific to Shiny, but for doing other stuff, running them in, in background jobs. So there are several useful examples uh, that is in that repo. Yeah. Okay, so, so before we proceed, I don't know if there are any questions based on the background jobs before I proceed to the next parts. We're going to be looking at in debugging Shiny app. Okay, so I think I have to proceed because of time. Okay, so this part talk about uh, controlling the viewer pane. So they are, uh, we can run in viewer pane. I think this is always, this is the default for Shiny. It's always run in the viewer pane. We can also run it, run it external, opens the app in your uh, usual web browser. We can also run the Shiny app in our, in our R Studio console. So let's see that how it's been done. So I have my app.r file. So we can see that we have several options. We can run in Windows, which is going to pop up a new Windows in our R Studio environment. So this is, let's uncheck this. I need it to be run in Windows. Yeah, in Windows. So what I'll do, I use keyboard shortcut, control shift enter to start. Oh, I need to save. I need to save this app. I've not saved this. I make some changes. So let me use keyboard shortcuts, control shift enter, shiny run up. We can see it here that we are running it in a in a windows we are running it in windows in viewer pane so let's see let me change that to say run it uh in viewer pane this is going to run the app here in our house studio viewer pane so let's see that how it's been done be sure okay it's viewer pane now control shift enter it's going to run the app the app is going to drop here uh which is very useful but this is used very useful if the app is very small 
Well, what about we are developing app that a bigger app? In that case, they do explain we should not use uh, this process. If we have a bigger app, if we have a bigger app in that process, we need to run it. We need to run it in external uh, window, which is our browser. I say Control Shift Enter, uh, which is going to launch this app in our browser. Can we see that? Hello. Yes. I, yeah. So it's going to launch the app automatically uh, in our browser. So those are the three uh, workflow in which uh, they explain in the book about uh, starting uh, running our shiny app. So they explain running in the in our windows. This is a default. This is the default setting for every application is always set to windows, but we can also run it in viewer pane or we can run it in an external browser, which is very uh, useful for bigger apps because as we are creating the app, we see the app how they are going to look like in real life. So we have also seen running the app in background job. We can we have seen that. But later on in the book, we will look at record tests, run tests. So we'll see that when we are doing testing. So that is not for discussion uh, for, for today. So that is basically what uh, they discuss uh, in this part, controlling the view of our shiny app. So I don't know, is there any question before I proceed to the next part? Yeah, I think it's clear up to there to me. Okay. okay, so for debugging shiny apps, so at least start uh, with this also quote that it is an eight line app, what could possibly go wrong? So this is a quote uh, from the author of the book, Adley Wickham, that is an eight line app. What is wrong with my app? My app is not working. So he said that the process of systematically comparing your expectation to reality until you find the mismatch, which is uh, oddly, oddly quote, that maybe once we discover that something is wrong with my app, we need to go uh, line by line. We need to look at our code. Maybe in, in that process, uh, we might discover uh, the real, uh, problem where we are having problem. And so before then we now think of how we can uh, solve uh, that problem. So because he said that something will go wrong definitely when we are creating a shiny app in which I agree with him, that it takes years of experience uh, to write code that works at the first time. So we need a robust workflow to identify and fix the mistake. Um, specific focus on the three debugging challenges are to shiny, shiny up. So we need to look at the, the debugging techniques. So we have seen, we have seen that the three debugging challenges in shiny. The first one is that you do not get unexpected error, which is the simplest. Then once we get this unexpected error, we, we can use, we, we are going to get our trace back so within from this trace back, we can use our interactive debugger. So once we go into the interactive debugger, we can experiment to see what is causing this error. And from there, uh, we can be able to solve our problem. But if this does not help for us, we can we now move back to the second part, which he talks about, you get any errors. So we get an error. You Here don't get use... you don't get any errors. Oh, sorry. You don't yeah. get any errors. So in that case, we use uh, interactive debugger and also our own investigative skills. So we use the interactive uh, debugger and also our own investigative skill in order for us uh, to be able to fix that problem. So for the last part, it talks about if these two techniques uh, does not help us, then everything here, we look at everything is correct, but no updates, which is the hardest part in which Adley talks about. So in that case, our debugging skill cannot help us in that case. In that case, we need to look for help, which we'll talk about in the last part of our discussion today. We are going to see uh, how we can look for help by creating a minimal uh, reproducible uh, example. So that is basically 
uh, what this uh, flowchart in which Hadley uh, presented is talking about. So the first think, part is- sorry. I think the lower left, the lower left uh, part of the flowchart, instead of track back, I think it meant trace back, you get tra track back, uh, lower left. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Instead yeah. of track back, yeah. <laughs> yes, I think it's a mistake, it's a mistake. Maybe I will look at uh, the flowchart, maybe I can correct that and maybe make, submit uh, a, create a pull request on the repository so okay. that it can be corrected. Thank you for that. So you, you the first part we say with, you get an unexpected error, which is the easiest. We are always get, going to get a, a trace back info that points to where the error occurs. So the trace back is just like a sequence of calls, uh, a call stack, which is going to show us a sequence of calls uh, in which we have made before uh, we get that error. And we can also use the interactive uh, debugger, a tool to investigate and track down the root cause of our problem. So the, this other part said all the values are correct, but they, they are not updated when uh, when they are all the value oh, stay, stay at code for one hour. Okay. All the values are correct, but they don't they are not updated when when you expect solution most challenges problem. It is unique to Shiny. Uh, you cannot take advantage of existing our debugging skills in this uh, process. This is a, a very technical problem in which uh, at times uh, we cannot use our interactive debugging skill will not help us in this process because in this process we need somebody that is very that has uh, a vast knowledge experience more experience uh, developer that will help us in this process there we need to write a good reprex uh, which we'll see later so yeah they talk about fixing error with trace back so a trace back is just like a sequence of calls uh, in which we have made and it's going to show those sequence before we get the error. Like this is the first call, which is the main call. This one called this. This one also make reference to this from call two reference, call three, call three reference, uh, call four. So this as our, uh, the call stack is going to look like. So example, look, reading a trace back uh, in R, we have a function, which is F, which is a function of what X and X called G of, x we have g which is also a function and g called h of x we also have h which is also a function and this is two times two so when we have f of three and f of three is going to output that we have four so when we also have f which is a function of g of x we have g which is a function h of x we have h which is also a function of x times two so when we call f of a, this is going to generate error. This will generate an error. It's going to say f of a error in x times two non-numeric argument to binary operator because we are passing in a string rather than a, a numeric value. So it's going to throw an error and it's going to print. Once we print uh, the trace back for this error, it shows that uh, we have f of a, this called G of X, this called H of uh, X. So when we flip this, uh, when we flip this uh, trace back, when we flip this uh, trace back, it shows that this is the call we make, this call reference G of X, reference H of X, because before it throws the error. So we can see, we can see the sequence of call and we can see, we can, see the offending function that is resulting into an error because f of a is always expecting we pass in a numeric value. So since we are passing in a character, so it's going to throw an error in our R console. But in Shiny, this is different from Shiny. When we come back to Shiny, Shiny is very difficult 
uh, for us to run trace back because our uh, as our, our Chinese once we load the shiny app, uh, we cannot print run trace back again because our 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 console is very busy at that moment. But in shiny, what shiny does is that shiny uh, is going to print is going to print is going to print this trace back in our console is going to print this trace back for us in our console. So we like now we have library shiny. We have function, which is a function this called reference this g g call h of x. We have h h call x times two. So we have the UI, which is a flow page. We have select inputs, input ID is N. Our, lab, our, our label is N. Our uh, choices is one to 10. We have a plot output, which is plot. This is a server. We have using output dollar sign plot. We are using a render plot, which is a reactive. Create some inputs, just output the plot. So, but once we run, once we run this code, we are going to get this error uh, message. So let me copy that and let's see uh, the code in R. Let's see the code in R. Thing I've copied. Go on here. So shiny, run, run, run. Oh, sorry. Run, server, start the shiny app. So once we start the shiny app, we are going to get this error, non-numeric argument to binary uh, operator. But when we come back to our R Studio, it's going to print, it's going to print the 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 call stack, the trace back. It shows it shows G one, which is F. It shows the render, which is the reactive call. And it also shows anonymous. And anymore, we can see that this line is starting the shiny app. Uh, output dollars and plots, which is, uh, which is uh, the reactive, which is rendering the plot because it's expecting our input must be numeric because they, it's a non-numeric. So in order for us to fix uh, this problem, if we want to really see all the line of code, we can just say options. We can set options. Within option, we have shiny. Uh, shiny dots true. Shiny uh, true shiny dot call stack. I think it's shiny dot call stack. No, it's shiny dots. I can see shiny. Yeah, I'm not sure as well about this. It's shiny dots. I can't see shiny dots. Okay, I know what's shiny. Ah, okay. So you call it explicitly from the package. Wait, let me check. I think I have debugging. I have a script here. File. Trace back. I think it's going to be here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Shiny dot full start trace. Mm -hmm. Where is the script I'm working on? Mm. 
So, yeah. Shiny dot full tax trace. So we run this again. So once we start, oh, sorry, the app is still running. Stop. Okay, so once we now go back to our, our console, it will show us. Wait, stop this app. It's supposed to show us. Run, start the app. Okay, supposed to show sequence of call. Like from one, yeah. This is what I want to see. It will show us from one, all these are all the call in which Shani has made up till the time we get that error. But this one is very useful if you want to, if you want to view all the sequence of call that is from one till up till 175. These are all the call, all the computation in which Shani has done up to that. We can see that for if we are tracing the problem, we can see that this is running the Shiny app, but from here up, these are all functions that are maybe specific to Shiny. I think they are not related to our problem. So we can just keep on going until we get to where uh, we start to see reactive calls. So we keep on going. We can see all the computation in which Shiny has done up to where we have the offending function, where are the reactive? These are all specific to Shiny. And it's not related to our problem. I can see the reactive call, do catch, do force. Have you seen the plot outputs? Mm. Environment. 104. Okay, one oh four. That's with reactive something. With reactive domain, yeah. But it's like it's not. It's supposed to show. Okay, it's here. Output dollars and plots. So yeah. this output dollars and plot. Remember, if we go back to here, if we go back to our code, we see that we pass in a select input. So this select input in here is reading this as a string rather than it being a numeric. So for us to fix that problem, we need to wrap it in as dot, I think numeric. We need to as dot numeric. I think we need to wrap it so that it's no, that is a numeric value. So once we start the app, we can see that we have been able to solve that problem. We can see that uh, we are able uh, to solve that problem by wrapping it in a reactive call that it should be as dot numeric. So I can say seven. We can see that the app is working fine. We can pick 10. We can see that the app is working. So that is uh, just uh, one fix. Let me stop the app, okay? So by wrapping that in as dot numeric, so I'll just undo that and save, save that, sorry. So I don't need to save, stop. And go back to my notes. So that is that on how we can deal with uh, call stack, how we can see. So like for R, so at least flip this. So it say run up, which will start the app. This is output dollars and plots. I think this is related to our problem because in our select input is, is going to pass the inputs as a string. So we need to convert that string uh, to numeric because if you look at the error message, the error message have given us a clue, non-numeric arguments are to binary operators. So once we see that, we need to, so that we can figure out what is the wrong with the app in which we are uh, working on so we can easily fix uh, that problem. 
So they also talk about uh, three component to a shiny error stack. So the three components are uh, to the shiny error stack in which I have explained. So when we look at run up, run up is doing what is starting the app. The second problem, we look at output dollar sign plot, uh, which is the offending function because we are passing in a string because Shani expects to get a numeric value. So that is why uh, it threw the error. So, but all these, they, they are all reactive. Uh, they are specific to Shani. So we need to look at the offending function. So we fix that function then, then our code is going to work because they talk about the third is the code that have been written. So which is the render plot, we can see app.r as 13. This is just the line of code line number 13, this is line number three, this is like line number four in the app door file. Okay. Okay, so they also talk about fixing errors using uh, interactive uh, debugger. So in this case, when we do, when do we use, when we have error, we use a trace back and we want to figure out what is causing it. There we can use a debugger interactive debugger to debug our code. So in this interactive debugger, there are two new techniques in which we are going to learn. We are going to learn on how we can use the browser. And we also, and in this browser, we can initialize browser using condition. Like we say, if input dollar sign value is equals to A, then true, take us to the browser. Or we can say, if my reactive is less than zero, then take us to the browser. And we, when we get this browser, it's just like a, our interactive console. And from there, we can begin to experiment. We can also, uh, we can also use within this interactive debugger, there are some useful techniques. We can press N to get to the next function. We can say C to leave the debugger, continue uh, running the R code. And we can also, uh, we can also press Q to quit so we can see some of those techniques. We can see from some of those techniques uh, where is debugging. So we can see this is debugging. So I can run Shiny, we have some default data. We can have this so I can start my browser. So once I run the app, so once I run the app, uh, the app will run. It will not show anything. If I go back uh, here, you see that it will take me uh, to interactive debugger, which is an interactive environment. And we can see that I set it at line two. It wants, because I want to experiment to see what is going on here. So I can just say head, head of what? I want to see the head of that. It shows that that has four, five, six, NA, 20 and NA. So I can say summary of that so we can begin to experiment i can say mean of that which is going to return any because of the any that is there so we can experiment in this case we can say mean of that you can say any dot rm equals true so when we say any dot rm equals true we can say we we still have any we still have any because Argument is not okay. Na dot rm true. Say argument is not numeric. Returning na. So we we can see. Uh, once we do that, we can see where we are having errors, and we we are can able easily trace. Uh, we are how to fix it. But once we are in the, this debugger, we can click on next to step to the next line of the function. We can click on step into the current function. Uh, we can click on execute, we can click on continue to continue running the code, or we can stop. This stop, we are going to stop, we are going to terminate the running of the app. We go back to our R code and keep on experimenting on the, with the code. So once I click on run, it's going to run that app, in which we can view it, is with just returning any because there were some uh, missing data in the app. Okay, so I'll just stop this and go back to the notes because of time.
Uh, we have seen debugging a reactivity, which is the hardest problem to debug. We need other tools which are not introduced in this chapter because the debugging reactivity is very difficult. So there was, we need other tools and that is not uh, discussed in this chapter, but we can use sprint debugging to show uh, to, to show some values. We can also use message here, a standard output versus standard error. We can also use message uh, to send uh, that uh, results to view. So this in the last part uh, of this uh, book, they talk about if we have looked at, we have seen the development cycle, we have seen the debugging, and in the debugging, we, uh, we have looked at the useful techniques. We, can, we have seen how we can use interactive debugger, how we can use the browser. Though I have not, I did not explain the breakpoints within our studio. Within our studio, uh, we can set, we can just set, we can set breakpoints uh, within our studio. We can set breakpoints, which is similar uh, so what we can just set breakpoints. So this is just like we want to stop the app there. So in this case, I comment out this. And uh, the useful things about this is that they are not R code. And since they are not R code, we are not going to com commit this. Uh, uh, it's not working. Expect it to break. Sorry. Oh, oh, oh. I expect it to take me to my browser because of time. Maybe we'll proceed, but normally it's supposed to stop at this line supposed to stop me at this line and launch the same interactive console where we can experiment just as we did with the browser. So, so, so for debugging, so we have seen this. So now if we have tried this approach and we are unable to fix our problem, the last part they talk about, we need to look for help. And before we look for and look for help, we need to write a good uh, reflex. And, and where we can submit this reflex, uh, we can submit in the Shiny community, uh, which is a very good site that is read by almost, uh, that is read by uh, the uh, Shiny developer. Every Shiny developer, they always uh, visit this site uh, to, to improve uh, their Shiny skill by helping others uh, solve their problem relating to Shiny. So a good reflex is some R code that works when you copy and paste it in a R session and on another computer. So someone else, I need to grab the same uh, reflex in which you submitted. I need to run that reflex. I need to arrive at the same problem in which you are having in your own console. So a good reflex make it easy for others to help you debug your app. Below is an example of a shiny reflex in which uh, they explain how to make a reflex. So we need to make it simple as possible. They do advise that we should make use of built-in data sets, example, MPG or Iris. We create a simple data set uh, to illustrate the problem. Then we can use dputs. We can use dputs to create that data set. Example, they use my data which is data.frame, we are passing X and also Y. So when they uh, run it, they can use dput on my data. So dput will just give you a structure of the data sets where we can use to post in any forum to seek for help. Uh, they explain that we should make sure to we use uh, relative parts rather than using the absolute parts because if you are using relative parts, uh, we are sure that any of, anywhere we are posting uh, this reflex, someone will be able to run it and get to the same problem uh, we are having. So they also recommend we should use the styler 
which is the Stadiverse style guide to start, style this code using the Stadiverse uh, syntax. So making, making a minimal reprex, which is a reproducible example. So how do we do that? So we have first all the packages we use. So we need to say library shiny, shiny app, which is the, these are the UI part of the code. Then this is the server. Within the server, we pass in, we have some data sets. We have some variable we are looking at. So here we were the they use time series. Uh, this is a time series object. They use some print, which is space, minimum of time, of time series. Then we have some outputs, which is the, uh, that is they are using render UI uh, within the server, which is a very, uh, uh, that is they are rendering the UI uh, within the server. So making the bad repex uh, minimal. So we load needed packages with the uh, at least style recommended. We should always use the styler package uh, to style uh, the code. So we they loaded all the packages. Uh, they specify the UI. They look at the server part of the code. The server part of the code. So this is the, these are the server parts. Then the then the now starts uh, the shiny app. So once they start the shiny app, uh, the shiny app is uh, the shiny app is going to run and is going to show is going to print uh, the error in our console. So in order for us to figure out what is actually causing uh, this error, we need to do a lot of experimentation. So and they convert the date times with where you see the time of the time. So we look at also the server function and make some changes in the server function. So after it makes uh, some changes in the server function, uh, it now generate the new UI, which is what it gave here. Then it use uh, the verbatim text expose, then it breaks. So it, once, before even starting the app, he has begun to see pointer to where, uh, pointer to where uh, there are likely issues uh, within the app because he was using main max, which is what he's using here in the value, which is main max, which we are passing a function into another function. But rather than in, for him to fix this, he converted this uh, value where he say main max, he converted it actually to you convert that to range because when you check min max, you can see that it's a function because you check the minimum of date time is there, maximum is there, it return an error. So when he was able to correct uh, this, he figure out uh, with placing value with range of date time, uh, was able uh, to, to fix uh, that problem. And he was able uh, to, to run uh, the app uh, successfully. So, in order before before I wrap wrap up uh, the session, so let me just uh, let me just recap what we learned for today. Before let me just see. Let's go back to recap. I want. I want no. Workflow. The recap of what we learned. I want where we get the workflow. Okay, so we so for today we look at uh, the workflow. We have we have seen the development cycle of a shiny app where we are going to create the app. We make some changes. We experiment uh, quickly. Uh, then we also look at uh, debugging. So we where we use uh, the interactive debugger and also some of our investigative skills uh, where we look at the browser, we look at uh, the breakpoints where we investigate to see where we got error. So, but if we cannot fix our problem, we can also see that uh, Shani, you recommend that we need to write reprex. And when writing the reprex, uh, they explain that we should make it minimal as possible. Uh, I think uh, that is all I have uh, for the chapter. 
I don't know if there are any questions. So sorry, I, I am four minutes past the time. Yeah, thank you. I think that was great. Uh, I've learned a lot and the workflow actually contains a lot that probably we need to pay keen attention in every bit of it in the debugging side. <laughs> Fixing errors, trace bugs, uh, reprex, uh, things. It, it's a lot of new things that will require some time to master all of it. Yes, as always, all over for me. Thank you so much for the good presentation. I think we all learn a lot from the presentation. This chapter, I think it is very important. It is like maybe the foundations on how to start writing or how to be more efficient writing shiny apps. So thank you so much for the presentation, Aloha Femi. Thank you very much. In this case, let me stop here.